Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly look at news from around the world. It's Friday, October 21st. Today, we're looking at Liz Truss's stepping down after six weeks at number 10. And where does Britain go next? Then, from the shortest tenure of a British prime minister in 200 years, we'll move to looking at how Xi Jinping is trying to become the longest serving leader of China since Mao Zedong. Then we'll take a look at what's happening in Iran, where another week of protests are upsetting a regime that has now also decided to throw its weight behind Russia's war in Ukraine. Here to talk about all these issues is Nahal Tusi, senior foreign affairs at, uh, reporter at Politico. Hi, uh, 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 hi, hi, Nahal. Hey, it's great to be here. Uh, Nirmal Ghosh, U.S. Bureau Chief at The Straight Times. Nirmal, great to have you back. Thank you. Good to see you. And Steve Erlang, our chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe of the New York Times. Steve, great to see you again. And we have a special guest, Catherine Nealon, political editor at Tortoise Media, to help us understand how a head of lettuce beat the head of the British government. Welcome, Kat. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. And you're joining us from Parliament, uh, Westminster, uh, maybe the locker room or something like it. This is uh, this is where reporters, uh, I guess, are hanging out. But whoa, what a week we've had uh, just in the in the last uh, 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 literally seven days. Uh, resignation upon resignation upon resignation. Uh, and now after uh, just a little over six weeks, Liz Truss stepped down and we'll have a new leader and a new prime minister in Britain. Uh, by sometime next week. Uh, tell us how this came about. I mean, it is really remarkable when you think about it. Uh, and, and also, you know, where 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 is this going? How uh, how will this play out? Um, OK, so uh, a lot to unpick there. Um, I think probably it started uh, by the fact that after she secured only uh, a third of the votes of MPs, um, Liz Truss, instead of trying to build bridges and do what usual leaders would do, which is to appoint from their other teams so that there are there are broader forces there, um, she decided she was not going to do that. And she just appointed her loyal uh, supporters, which meant that when the end came, it came pretty quickly. Um, and actually, it was it was really, you know, she, she kept saying she was going to make unpopular decisions and was he going to new term, but the U-turns kept coming. And um, it was a series of unforced errors. Uh, she sacked her chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, a week ago today. And uh, I think at that point, I said to some friends and colleagues, I don't think she's going to be here this time next week. I actually... Didn't really believe that it would happen, but I did make a bet with my editor, which was a point which I will now be cashing in at some point. Um, and and yeah, so this week has been one of the strangest weeks that I've ever seen. And obviously, having worked through Brexit and the subsequent years, um, there have been some very strange weeks in in Westminster. Um, and I think the lettuce has been. Probably a highlight, a bit of light relief for people. Um, I think probably the the low point might have been um, these accusations of uh, MPs being manhandled and uh, bullied into voting with the government, uh, which happened on Wednesday evening. And it was then the morning after that that uh, Liz Cross was told things can't go on, and she made. A statement that was almost as short as her premiership, uh, and so there we are. It's over for Liz Truss. Boris Johnson is potentially coming back. So explain explain that, and and I want to open it up also to to uh, to Nahal, Steve, and and your mom to ask ask you questions. But explain. Or if remind you know uh, Boris Johnson, of course, had to resign. Was forced to resign because he would lost the confidence of the. Uh, uh, of the conservative members of parliament because he had lied uh, about partying during COVID lockdown, uh, famously. And and now, it, you know, he's coming back. Uh, how does that work? Well, actually, uh, the, 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 the resignation was brought about um, ultimately by his uh, actions over another individual, a, a man who was a deputy chief whip uh, called Chris Pincher, 
who um, there were allegations that he had uh, groped uh, some people in a, in a, a, a private members club. And then it transpired that there had been sort of longer t- longer running allegations and that Boris Johnson had known about them and indeed had made the joke pincher by name, pincher by nature. Um, and despite this, that he had appointed him to his government. Um, and it was at this point, um, uh, and a senior, a former official in the Foreign Office uh, said, he confirmed that, that Boris Johnson did know about this. Um, and once that was confirmed, ministers started resigning and, and that was over. But the lead up to it was party gate. Um, which lasted over several months and and kind of eroded a lot of goodwill amongst people. Now, some of those same people who said they could never uh, sit uh, behind Boris Johnson as their leader are being asked to back him. And um, I I was just checking before we came on air to see where the numbers are. Uh, Rishi Sunak, who was the chancellor and one of the first to resign when all of this was kicking off earlier in the summer, has got, I think it was 77 uh, MPs publicly backing him. Uh, Boris Johnson is on high 60s, I think. And then there is a third candidate called Penny Mordaunt, who has been a minister under um, uh, Liz Truss and Boris Johnson, and before that, uh, Theresa May as well. And I think uh, David Cameron as well. She's been a minister for a while, but she's not a household name. Um, she is on about 25 or so. Um, so what has happened, the rules have been changed to allow all of this to take place. Ordinarily, um, a prime minister would have a year of a grace period in which they couldn't be challenged. Uh, but because the situation was just so untenable, those rules were changed. Uh, that meant, and, and the other the other rule that was changed was when we had the leadership contest in the summer, the threshold to uh, run as a, as a viable candidate was 20 MPs. Now you have to have backing of 100. And this is to speed up the process and also to ensure that you don't have uh, people that are not viable. Um, and there are some accusations that it may also be to keep Boris Johnson out, but I'm not sure that is necessarily uh, accurate um but it, be that as it may it, it, it is definitely making it more difficult and it is already uh bringing out some some divisions um you know we had a summer of the conservatives really airing their dirty laundry in public and it looks like we will have that again albeit in a week's sort of burst steve let me hand it, hand it just uh, over to you you've been a close observer of the scheme uh, for a while. Well, first of all, okay, okay, thank you very, very much. Um, to me, it goes back to the civil war inside the Tory party, which has been in power far too long. Um, and I was there, I covered the, you know, Cameron, Corbyn, the Scottish referendum, the, the Brexit referendum. And, and this is like, a, a war that may be finally coming to an end because you have a far right um, within the context of British liberalism, obviously, which has collapsed. Um, and I've always been intrigued whether you think it was quasi Cartang that pulled one off on Liz Truss, whether she actually knew what she was doing, which is one of the great questions that... I must say I, I have, I, but I, I, I just be really intrigued. I mean, the idea of Boris Johnson coming back as the great uniter from the outside seems like a very bad joke from private eye. But maybe that's all they've got left. I don't know. What do you think? Um, well, I mean, Boris Johnson was the leader that, that won the 2019 election. And that's where this um, coalition which I think you're right. I mean, the 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 the, the fraction fractiousness the, the, within the party goes back well in the current sort of form goes back at least seven years, I would say, but probably longer. Um, certainly, you know, kind of you look at the sort of Maastricht rebels 
um, you know, there has been this, this Eurosceptic uh, wing in the party for a long, long time, but they have got sort of more and more powerful. And that's obviously what <clears throat> led to Brexit. In 2019, you had um, this big uh, political shift, which led to what we call the red wall seats turning blue. That's the kind of Rust Belt type seats that were is sort of traditional blue collar workers that would normally vote for, for Labour turning uh, to Conservatives. And that has created an even less happy uh, ship of people who, who really do not see eye to eye. And Liz Truss, her policies almost seem designed to annoy both sides of the, of the spectrum, because on the one hand, you had her talking about immigration reform, making it actually easier for people to come in which was precisely the opposite of, of the intention of Brexit. And then on the other hand, you had uh, talking about fracking and liberalising planning, which there's, I don't know whether the word NIMBY means anything in America, but, you know, this is a certain, um, what we call then the opposite of the red wall is the blue wall, the sort of more traditional conservative leafy suburb type uh, seats. So she managed to annoy basically everyone. Um, and I think to your first question, um, her and Kwasi Kwarteng are sort of politically joined at the hip, which is why when she sacked him, we knew it was over. It takes a great talent to alienate everybody, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> In 44 days. Exactly. Ha half of which was taken up with mourning for the Queen and, <laughs> and, and we had a conference recess in the middle as well, which, you know, she disappeared for most of. So, um, yeah. The other thing is no one seems to feel sorry for her, which is in a way fascinating. Yeah, I think there was a lot of sympathy for Theresa May, um, actually. You know, um, she really was motivated by, and still is, she still sits as a backbencher, she still plays a very active role. She is motivated by genuine desire to do what she sees as her civic duty. There is a debate about how she gets there and her ideology on that, but I don't think anyone would say she's she doesn't believe in public service. Um, and, you know, uh, people have said to me, it, it's like Theresa May, but without the sympathy. But that's how they feel with her. You know, that there was no emotional attachment to Liz Truss. Yeah, Kat, in almost any other country, if you have uh, a situation like this, you would have new elections. Uh, the British system uh, doesn't uh, doesn't. Uh, really move in that direction, particularly since the leading conservatives uh, uh, are likely to lose a lot of seats. I think polls are showing them down twenty to thirty points to to the Labour Party. Uh, uh, but 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 how many times can you lose a prime minister? Uh, the Economist, I think, in its uh, uh, cover today, called it brittlely, which I think was very unkind to the, to the Italians. Um, who, uh, who, who are far more stable these days than uh, uh, than the turnover you were getting in, in terms of the Conservative Party, and it really is only the Conservative Party right now. Uh, uh, how does how does the country, as opposed to the Conservative Party, look to this, and what would they like to see happen now? I think probably the country would like a general election, um, but I I think the country is going to be upset and left <laughs> left uh sadly lacking I, I, I the conservatives are the ones that control that they are you know as you say they are doing terribly in the polls i think this morning there was one poll that said they were on 14 percent and if that was extrapolated out they would lose every seat in the country um so they are not going to call a snap election the only way that it would happen is if uh, Liz Truss was not able to go to the king and say, um, I've lost the confidence of, of uh, Parliament of MPs, but here is this person has the confidence of MPs, which is what uh, people are saying may happen if Boris Johnson, if Boris Johnson reaches the threshold, it seems quite likely that members would vote for him because he was very, very popular with the members. Um, but he is not so popular amongst some MPs. And so there is this question mark about will the members impose another leader that in Westminster people do not want um, and arguably in the country people do not want. And if so, that could potentially 
bring around a, a general election. But I think that would be quite unlikely because it would be the turkeys voting for Christmas. Yeah, and as we know, Turks don't vote for Christmas. Uh, Kat, uh, <laughs> thanks so much for uh, for helping us understand what is a really complicated set of issues. Uh, fascinating, though, to uh, uh, to watch at least from the outside. Not so fascinating, I'm sure, if you're uh, uh, experiencing it uh, and, and the consequences for the country, because uh, governing is not a laughing matter. Um, so uh, thanks for joining us. Really uh, great to have you uh, uh, from an, an underground and in this case, inside parliament look uh, at the state of British politics. Uh, we'll invite you back next when we uh, when we have another uh, uh, one of these uh, very strange weeks, uh, hopefully not for, for a while, but we'll invite you back when we need to understand what's happening in Britain. In the meantime, thanks. Uh, really uh, want to thank you for uh, for joining us. Thanks for having me. So uh, as I said, that was that was terrific. So uh, we're moving from um, uh, Nirmal from uh, a uh, the shortest British prime minister in 200 years to an attempt by Xi Jinping uh, in the party congress, which is concluding on Thursday. Um, uh, sorry, on Sunday uh, with uh, the, the the crowning uh, uh, of uh, an extension of Xi Jinping's term as general secretary of the of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, which would break uh, the rules of um, uh, of having uh, two terms and and, and out. Uh, the Congress has been going on. Xi Jinping gave his address. Uh, um, uh, bring us up to date about what what has been happening in the past week and what the reaction has been, including in particular in the region that you know so well in 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 South Asia, where people are watching. Uh, as the rest of the world is, but people are particularly watching so closely what's happening. Right. Thanks, Ivo. So, so obviously, as you said, there's at the moment really no reason to suppose he will not get another term, although technically, of course, you know, it's, it's going to happen Sunday. But at the conclusion of the plenum, we will also see a 200 member central committee, a Politburo and a seven member Politburo standing committee. And that last one will also be very closely scrutinized. And there is also a reshuffle on the cards of the military's top brass. And that will be what for signals or not of intention on Taiwan which is the most proximate concern. We have to watch out who is named on this central military commission, the CMC. But regardless of all that, the broad agenda is still there and will continue to strengthen the domestic economy, reduce dependence on foreign countries, security, of course. But security is a given. Um, now, these events, of course, are very scripted, very ritualistic. It's all about projecting power and ideology. And in his speech, uh, President Xi Jinping said Beijing would not tolerate protectionism and bullying by other nations. He referred to a time of great changes. He said our country has entered a period of development in which strategic opportunities, risks, and challenges are concurrent. Nothing exactly new in there. But on Taiwan, which everyone was waiting for, he said resolving the Taiwan issue is the Chinese people's own matter. And a few other things again, nothing terribly new. But just last Monday, in speaking of reactions, Secretary, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said plans to annex Taiwan are moving forward on a, quote unquote, much faster timeline than previously expected. He said there has been a change in approach, a fundamental decision from Beijing that the status quo is no longer acceptable. So, and that they are going to pursue reunification by coercive means, and of course, it doesn't work in forceful means. And two days later, the chief of the U.S. Navy Admiral, Admiral uh, Mike Gilday said the U.S. should be prepared for the possibility of a Chinese invasion before 2024. Now, to his credit, he did say, I don't mean at all to be alarmist. It's just that we can't wish that away. Now, it's hard to argue with the last part. Of course, you can't wish anything away. But honestly, anecdotally, I don't think this view is shared by many China watchers. And we, uh, watchers. and uh, we can go into the reasons. You know, there's so much at stake You, you know, in, in an invasion of Taiwan. Uh, the next thing to watch for here in D.C. is the Taiwan Policy Act, which would really upset Beijing because if it goes through the way some people want it to, it would, in effect, upgrade U.S.-Taiwan ties, upgrade Taiwan status. Different versions are under consideration in the House and the Senate, and it's likely it will end up a little less provocative. There are many, obviously, in Congress who do see the downside. We have to wait for the outcome there. It might come this year, it might come early next year. In Southeast Asia, there is 
a view that China should not be forced into a situation in which it appears weak or Xi Jinping risks losing face and is then forced to accelerate that very timeline, uh, forced to use co coercion and or force to annex Taiwan. That is the danger, that there is this choreography going on, or escalation, if you will, and uh, it will force China into doing something to show that it, that it has to do something. Uh, Nirmal, I think you sketch a, 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 uh, a picture that is, that is both complicated and uh, uh, full of danger in one form or another of people miscalculating and misunderstanding and miscommunicating uh, in, in some ways. Uh, in the speech, and, and, and Steve, would love to sort of get your sense of how the speech and the week has been seen in Europe, which doesn't share the, the U.S. alarmism, and the alarmism has gotten bigger over time with, uh, I think, the Biden administration moving closer and closer to the kind of nihilistic views that the, the Trump administration had about the relationship. Uh, 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 is there a concern that this may just get out of hand because we're mishandling it as opposed to getting out of hand because we're misunderestimating, to uh, coin a favorite phrase, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Chinese in the way that we, in fact, misunderestimated the, the Russians uh, uh, prior to February 20, uh, 23rd? There is a deep concern. It gets heightened every time President Biden goes offline or online and says unscripted, we will defend Taiwan militarily, which is not our policy. It's not our stated policy. It's the president's stated policy. And every time he says it, it's been at least twice now, if not three times, the White House has tried to roll it back. And there are a lot of people including some in America, I think, who think we're getting over our skis on, on Taiwan because we are not ready to defend Taiwan. We're just not. I mean, that's part of what the naval admiral was saying, that we don't have the equipment, we don't have the ships. And it was very in interesting when um, Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan, which the Chinese decided to make into a big issue, it also let them practice the quarantining of Taiwan by ships. And we didn't do much about that. Um, so I, I find it, you know, a bit worrying. I do. Um, I find Xi Jinping, you, you know, who said there will be reunification, he's been talking like by 2050 or something without being explicit as to how. The more they crack down in Hong Kong and Macau, the less likely it is that Taiwan's going to say, yeah, let's let's give it a shot. And in Europe, as you say, I mean, Europe is not the peer rival to China that the United States thinks that it is. I mean, Europe has interests in the Pacific, but not the same kind of military interests. Um, and there is just a need to trade with the biggest market in the world, which is China. And, and Europe is basically export driven and, and it is being much more careful. It's true about Chinese espionage, NATO's paying attention. It's, it's talking about screening investments. It's worried about Confucius centers in, in European universities. I mean, it's aware of some of what China's up to, um, and China has been losing a lot of its soft power. But at the same time, China, you know, its rise is there. It's part of the future. And um, Taiwan, as we all know, is Taiwan and China are one country, because that's what we've been saying right along. But how they become or stay one country is a really risky proposition. So yes, I mean, a very long answer. Europe is very nervous. Uh, Nahal, I think one of the reasons perhaps that Europe is nervous because it seems that there is a shift uh, in, the, in the Biden administration, or at least a consolidation of the view that this is now no longer a win-win relationship. It really is a zero-sum one in which the only way we can secure what we need is if if China doesn't uh, uh, win. And I think the 
we will look back at the chip uh, and semiconductor uh, controls of about 10 days ago as really a signal of we really don't want China, uh, we, we want China to fail, uh, as opposed to we want China to succeed. Is that too far uh, to pushing it? Is, is the idea that we need to cooperate, which is what Tony Blinken talked about in his big speech, uh, 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 where we where we can. It is in the national security strategy too about the importance of cooperation on global issues. But somehow Washington doesn't seem to be able to 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 uh, chew and uh, walk and chew gum at the same time when it comes to cooperation and competition or confrontation with China. Yeah, I mean, look, this is a a politically salient issue to some extent. So it it kind of pays off somewhat to be a China hawk and to be extra hawkish. But when it comes down to it, I still think, look, I have a thousand thoughts on this. I, I'll just tell you, I mean, first of all, the there might be bipartisan agreement that China is a, the long-term geostrategic threat, but the Republicans and the Democrats are not necessarily working together the way that they could be to to tackle this threat. I broke a story the other day about how the top Republican on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is has put a block on plans that the Biden administration has to restructure the State Department to address the China threat, right? I mean, there are all sorts of things happening where they are just not on the same page by any means in terms of whether it's, you know, how far to go to address um, what everyone ag agrees is a threat. Now you can call it a competition, competition, whatever. Uh, another thing to bear in mind is, you know, I, I understand that like <laughs> President Biden um, goes out there and keeps saying, yeah, we'll send troops to defend Taiwan. I think that that's actually, you know, what he would like to do. But I think what he's actually really trying to do, and this is just my analysis of it, is he's just trying to send a signal to Xi, like, if you're going to do this, don't do it during my presidency. You know, this is about buying time, I think, you know, to basically tell Xi, like, hold off and at least until I'm gone, because if you're going to do it while I'm here, I will send troops. Uh, our understanding of the Chinese military is not frankly, it's probably not as good as our understanding of the Russian military was. And apparently our understanding of the Russian, Russian military was terrible. So that's another challenge. When the Chinese went out there and did these exercises in the Nancy in the wake of Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan, it was actually a major intelligence bonanza for us. So to a degree, I'm sure there were people who were kind of glad they were seeing what the Chinese were willing and able to do. Uh, and then the other thing, look, again, I'm, I'm not going to go on forever, but I could. Um, well, two other things. One is that, you know, we, the argument is we're not necessarily prepared to define Taiwan, but Taiwan is necessarily not necessarily prepared to defend itself. The Taiwanese people have not really fully woken up to this threat. They are not quite like the Ukrainian people. I mean, I just feel like the Ukrainians seemed more prepared, but then they've been fighting the Russians for for eight years, right? So it, it's I, I'm not sure that the Taiwanese themselves have have quite figured this out. And then the other thing that gets me is like if you look at this discussion, it's like, oh, is Europe with us or not with us? I mean, come on, okay, forget Europe. What about Africa? What about Latin America? What about the entire global South, where there's all these countries where China has made extraordinary diplomatic inroads through a variety of factors and reasons um, that probably deserves its own show and probably has one somewhere. Uh, and, you know, what are we going to do when they are able to use those connections to strengthen their standing everywhere. The Taiwanese have lost their diplomatic relations with several countries over the past years in Latin America and in Africa because the Chinese have made a better case. And frankly, there is an argument that because that has happened, it has me meant that the United States and the Chinese are actually on a path greater to confrontation because the Chinese feel more emboldened than ever when it comes to Taiwan. Does that help? <laughs> No, I, yeah, I think it's uh, it, it, all all valid points. Glad you brought them all uh, all to the table. And Nirmal, just to, to to conclude, which I think, as as Nahal said, we not only could you do an entire show, you can do an entire week, entire month on this. This is this is, after all, the big geopolitical, geoeconomic confrontation that that exists. But uh, I, I wonder, is there a danger that? which tends to be a pretty American danger to always think that the other guy is 10 feet tall. When in fact, when you look at some of the issues that the Chinese confront, the economic decline, which led to the postponement of 
uh, the GDP reporting numbers because of fear that they were actually not very good. Uh, zero COVID, which means uh, you're just postponing the moment at which COVID comes through the population. Uh, the demographic challenge that is now for the first time uh, more people are dying than are being born in in, in China and 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that the Chinese are relying on Russian military equipment, which as we see is not particularly good uh, uh, to, to fighting wars. Is there a, a, a concern? Is there anyone in Washington when you report to or back uh, in, in, in the region uh, that you come from that is actually say, wait, wait a minute, you know, this idea that these guys are as strong may be uh, uh, more a, a figment of Xi Jinping's and, and U.S. Hawk's uh, imagination. The reality is they got a long way to go. Yeah, and actually, <clears throat> in the end, at the end of the day, it's probably somewhere in between. The, the problem with uh, with talking about China's problems, which you know, as you, you listed them, is that you go back to the to sort of again, if people take it to an extreme idea that China is, you know, is going to sort of collapse, and all the problems are so huge that China is going to founder and all that stuff. And that again is you know uh, overestimating uh, the size of the problem. So it's it's weirdly a combination of both. Um, and then there's this paranoia, I, I, I call it paranoia, for want of a better word, that China will actually exceed the U.S.'s military capabilities, I think, in 2027 or something like that. So um, in the region, in the region. So um, all these two, again, these two things sort of coexist. So it's kind of contradictory. Um, the, the collapse of China has been... Uh, has been predicted for a while and it hasn't collapsed. And um, there are still people in, in DC waiting for that to happen. And uh, meanwhile, the US itself and, and, and the West and Europe, which, uh, you know, as Stephen said, is not such a big um, part of this, of this, of this competition, um, have their own problems, the US and Europe as well. Sorry, it doesn't fly in the room. Um, so I think there is great danger, as Stephen said. Short supply. It's not a, a, a drone. A drone. I know we'll come. We'll probably come to that soon. <laughs> There's a great danger, as Stephen was saying, of of these various miscalculations and misunderstandings, and also the greater, um, again, the underlying uh, premise that war is going to be inevitable someday. You know, without actually explicitly saying, oh, eventually it's going to be a war, people are talking about arming Taiwan, doing this, doing that, containing China, eroding China, the CHIPS Act, or a whole gamut of things. There's a Tibet Act as well. So all these things sort of hedging in China. And um, the prospect for peaceful coexistence doesn't look very bright, I have to say, between these two powers. Uh, maybe in the near future is going to be okay. Um, um, as uh, as you said, it's President Biden has two more years, and then who knows what's happening, what's going to happen. This is the issue with with the U.S., of course, right? Uh, we don't have a guarantee of continuity of policy, uh, and that is a structural problem, which people, which other countries have to adapt to as well. Yeah, those darn elections. Uh, they they really can. You know, that's what the Chinese are trying to solve. Let Let's not change leaders anymore. At least there's predictability in that way. Uh, but. Uh, yeah. And just, just, just one very quick point. When I think of Ukraine and Putin, and I think of Xi and Taiwan, there is the delicate issue of the legacy of autocrats, what they say they want to do before they leave. P Putin's been pretty clear. She's been pretty clear. So that's one of the reasons people get nervous. I mean, it's out there on the table, um, and part of the power of an emperor Xi is um, what legacy he wants to leave, and he's committed to the unification of China as he sees it. Period. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very important point because it's clear he wants to do it before he leaves. Now we don't know when he will leave, and he now has a capacity to be there for another 10, 15 years or so. But that uh, that but the reality is that he wants to happen while he's still. Uh, there to be able to be recognized as the person who did unify uh, uh, China is, is I think, uh, point, point well taken. Um, talk about autocratic leaders, uh, Nahal. 
uh, staying in power for the long run and and uh, and and not wanting not wanting to go. Uh, Iran, uh, we are now. I guess it's almost week six uh, or week week five of, of very significant protests. We don't know as much as. Uh, as we would like because of uh, uh, media blackouts, et cetera. But uh, it, it, can, it, it is continuing and it doesn't seem that even violent crackdowns are ending these protests. And at some point you wonder how long can this go on? While at the same time, we see uh, uh, the Iranians uh, really doubling down on their opposition to the United States and some looking for support with the Chinese. But in this case, particularly with the Russians, by sending them drones uh, that are being used against uh, Ukrainian civilian uh, and infrastructure. Uh, really a, a, a very complicated situation if you are uh, the supreme leader in, in Iran. Um, how uh, how should we look at what's happening and 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 what is uh, w- where do you think this is heading? Yeah, so I've been trying to answer that question and I've been asking people who are much smarter than I am about this. And People keep saying the same thing to me, which is we just don't know. We don't know. We have look. The U.S. has a terrible track record of predicting, you know, what protest movements are going to turn into. So the idea that they're going to sit there and try to like make a prediction or whatever, I'm sure somebody in the intelligence community is doing something here and there, but does it have an actual realistic, you know, chance of being true? Nobody knows. Um, you know, and it's important to understand the, the way someone was describing it to me is that, look, this is basically a situation where you have a large number of small protests, but they're largely also leaderless. And this gives it a sort of uh, elasticity, but it also is a weakness in a way, because if you don't have a, a leadership that you can turn to to find out what they want, how you can negotiate that sort of thing, uh in the long run, that 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 could be a, a major weakness. Um, I do not get the sense, you know, from people I talk to, that the that the Iranian Islamist regime has really put out its big guns just yet. I don't. I think the crackdown could be much much worse. Um, it could get there. Uh, not that it's been great. I mean, it's been horrible so far. And they're they're shooting teenagers. It it's it's horrifying. Uh, But you also kind of wonder if part of their strategy is let's let this burn itself out. Let's let these kids, these teenage girls, whatever, just get out there and scream for a bit and we'll back off and maybe we'll like stop enforcing the headscarf laws for a while as strictly as we were. And then over time, this will just fade. Um, But the, the other side of that is that over time, it could become stronger. It could become more organized. And you could, through the crackdowns that you are doing as a regime, radicalize this generation, which really feels like it has nothing to lose. Uh, so it is a very, very delicate thing. And the United States is it, it is the Biden administration for political and other reasons has been speaking in support of the protesters. Uh, it has been doing certain things like relaxing some sanctions to allow them to get access to certain technologies, things like that, that they hope will support the protesters. Uh, but regime change is, is not the policy that they, that the administration supports. It is not. I am told that's not what's happening here. We're not saying we support regime change. Uh, and no matter how you define regime change, just to be clear, it doesn't always have to involve U.S. troops. Uh, and they are not yet willing to say that they're going to walk away from the Iran nuclear deal negotiations either. Now, there are really no negotiations happening on that front, but the idea that they would like put aside diplomacy, that is not that is not a factor, which is one thing that I know will will um, you know upset a lot of the Iranian activists because they feel like the fact that you're even negotiating with this regime legitimates and, and strengthens this regime. Two other factors to bear in mind, of course, the Russia stuff. Um, I don't, you know, I feel like that might be happening with or without the protests because the the Iranians are looking for sources of cash, and so selling weapons and missiles and drones to to Russia is one of them, um, but. You know, uh, it's and I am told that the United States will do more, impose more sanctions to to deal with that as well. Um, The other factor is the the health of the supreme leader of Iran. It has not been great. He's in his late 80s, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, He is the head. You know, he's the final word on all matters of state in Iran. But it's also important to remember that the Iranian system 
it's a system. It's not just one guy. Okay. So if Khamenei, Ayatollah Khamenei, the Supreme R- R- uh, Leader, uh, does die, there's a system in place to, to replace him. And that system also, by the way, includes the Islamic Revolutionary Guard and the Besiege, which are these indoctrinated and very pervasive and w- very well armed forces that exist to support this Islamist view and this Islamist revolution and to export it. And they are probably the biggest threat of all to the protesters. Uh, so, you know, overall, I guess I'm not painting a, a great, you know, happy picture, but um, I, again, we don't know where this is going to go. We didn't know in the Arab Spring. We didn't know in 1979. We're just not very good at this. Well, it's a, they're complicated, uh, but I think I think you've you've laid out exactly sort of all the all the factors that will, in one form or another, decide the outcome, uh, and we'll have to we'll, we'll we'll kind of have to see. Uh, I mean, one of the uh, uh, Steve, one of the points that that, that Nahal emphasized was uh, the continued urge to have some form of diplomatic engagement because of the nuclear deal, which which. I, I don't know what metaphor you want to use, hind leg, dead, whatever, however you want to go. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And of course, the other piece to that is the Europeans who have always wanted this, but they are moving in a different direction too, recognizing that there are no talks ongoing. Uh, 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 and, and as of what yesterday, I believe, imposing uh, uh, significant sanctions on the Iranians because of the drone uh, uh, sales. So in, in, in Brussels and the conversations you have, you've got great sources uh, uh, on uh, who are in, involved in the negotiation. Uh, do they see this as the one end of the road on the diplomacy, but two, an opportunity perhaps to get some positive political change uh, that comes out of these uh, these protests? I think they're feeling kind of overwhelmed by Ukraine and China and Iran and everything else. Um, I think the deal is, I guess the word I use is moribund, which is, you know, it's breathing, but it's lying there, you know, waiting for an electrical charge, which I don't think is going to happen. Um, you know, Russia, the Russia-Iran thing, which Mahal talked about, is really in- interesting, of course. I mean, it it's puts Iran in a very difficult place, particularly with Europe and with the United States, because it seems to be backing Russia's war. Uh, and yet Russia doesn't want a nuclear armed Iran either. I mean, so the JCPOA is still hangs there. And partly, uh, as, as we've said, it hangs there because no one wants to think about what to do if it's declared dead. I mean, then what do you do? I mean, do you bomb Iran? Do you let the Israelis bomb Iran? I think there's a lot of worry about restraining the Israelis, which are going through their own electoral campaign, uh, not to do something overt against Iran, though they're doing covert things. Um, and, and there has been a call from Iranian activists for Europeans to withdraw their ambassadors from Tehran. And so far, the EU hasn't done that, and European Union countries haven't done that. I wouldn't be shocked if they called them back for consultations. That would seem to me a logical thing to do, but they haven't done that yet either. So I think they're kind of feeling a bit overwhelmed. I, I think Nahal did a wonderful summary of kind of where we are and and sort of where the questions are. But there's no question it's a revolution that has a generational problem. Um, and even in Iran, among some of its people who are invested in the regime, they're less invested in the strict rules of Islam as defined by the Ayatollah. So there's always change. I mean, it's a vibrant country. It's a really interesting country. Um, and, you know, one can hope, but um, I do fear very much, and I think Europeans fear, they get too involved, they're going to create a crackdown, particularly with the Supreme Leader's ill. This is a time, a difficult time that um, could rebound badly. And yet, how do you do that and keep faith with, you know, the people who are fighting for the things Europeans say they 
they believe in, like gender equality and freedom of religion and freedom of assembly and democracy, right? It, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Uh, and no, no one knows where it's headed, and no one knows how to push it in the right direction. Um, so I fear Arab Spring is the most likely outcome, which is Arab Spring that's basically followed by a crackdown. Well, I, I think uh, foreign policy is by definition tough. Uh, uh, Sir Fadol was, it has complicated issues, but I think that you, you and, and Nahal really put your point on it is the question of how do you how do you manage this situation by what we do, we the United States, we the Europeans, uh, we who care about the kinds of issues that uh, the protesters are are, are on the street about? Uh, do you want in, in some ways to succeed, and yet on the other hand, you don't want to push them so far that there's a crackdown, even even more of a crackdown that is even more violent uh, and strengthens the regime's hands even more. So it's a it is a, a complicated issue, um, as are so many. Uh, we'll be uh, looking at them again. We'll be, of course, uh, back uh, again next week. Uh, but this week, I wanted to thank uh, Nahal Tusi, Steve Erlanger, Namal Ghosh, uh, and the special guest Kat uh, Nealon. Uh, to um, uh, for joining us for this uh, really interesting discussion, uh, complicated issues that we face uh, as we end the week here uh, on World Review. But we'll be back again next week with another.